Oh, hi everyone, it's Susie again from Esoteric Trading Solutions. I hope you're all well, living the life that you want to live, being kind to yourself, being kind to your family and friends, being kind to everyone else, and being kind to your animals, of course. Animals um, don't criticize and they're always lovely. I was just sitting here having a quiet moment and um, I trade a lot of things, like I trade foreign currency and I trade equity indices and I look at bond yields. And everything else and um, I also trade crypto and I have crypto investment portfolio as well and I was just and just on this theme of my last YouTube and just the fellow that I interviewed the other day Adrian Polgar who I thought was quite amazing um, just sort of chat about the similar parallel parallels gosh that's a hard word to say between 2008 and um, and now and when, when I'm doing, you know, a video, I never really prepare anything. I just talk to, to what I know because obviously, you know, I, I know a lot of stuff. And um, just it just seems to me that there are a lot of parallels between the market now, the financial markets, you know, the bond market, the credit markets, the equity markets, and even the currency markets to what it was like in 2008 in terms of the financial crisis. And... Put it very simply, the financial crisis in 2008 uh, started because of bad lending practices, basically. Banks lent out to um, uh, house owners, uh, you know, to house owners who basically couldn't afford to pay the mortgage repayments. So what would happen was um, interest rates were sort of at a reasonable level. Uh, you know, I think they're around five percent uh, in the U.S. at the time. Uh, lots of mortgages were done to people that couldn't actually afford, um, you know, house repayments. There was a housing boom. Lots of property was being, uh, you know, developed and, and constructed, and there was lots of uh, home owners that were in the market that basically, you know, bought houses. And because there was a housing boom, they bought them at housing uh, at inflate housing inflated prices. And essentially, uh, the banks use those housings as collateral for the loan. And as the loans, as people came through that couldn't pay their loans or you know got behind in terms of uh, their mortgages, <coughs> the banks started foreclosing on those loans. And what they found was initially that the house price had actually gone down below the debt on the loan and that's often the case when you're in a market particularly a housing market that's inflated you often find <coughs> excuse me that the price of the house that was actually bought was actually uh, you know high at the time and then obviously when the market turns the price of the house goes down but the debt doesn't go down unfortunately so what we saw basically was banks realized what was happening. A lot of people were getting in arrears with their uh, interest uh, mortgage repayments and they weren't even paying off principal. So some of the banks in 07 started panicking, um, some of the Morgan Stanley's and the Goldman Sachs and the like, and started packaging up these mortgage security, uh, started packaging up these mortgage, mortgage loans into mortgage uh, security SPVs which are called special purpose vehicles. So a whole combination of different mortgages, yours, mine, the person's next door, the person's across the road, whatever, were put into special purpose vehicles, almost like, um, how can I say, a basket, in, into a special purpose vehicle where they got a special credit rating from Standard & Poor's and Moody's and um, Moody's. So that the, the asset that was actually collateralized be collateralized with um, some money uh, and it would also have a combination of all different mortgages in this special purpose vehicle and what the rating agencies did was give these special purpose vehicles which were now a different type of asset a mortgage-backed security they would give them a triple a and the reason why they gave them a triple a even though the individual credits within that basket of, uh, of the security may have not been AAA. Obviously, you had, you know, you were waiting for a loan from, say, Joe Blow at the fish shop who had to repay, or someone, you know, that was on a statutory income, you know, on benefits who couldn't pay their loan. The reason why they gave them a AAA is because the banks would put up, say, a certain amount of money to bring them to a AAA credit rating level. 
Now, what happens with special purpose vehicles when you have a whole lot of different loans put into a special purpose vehicle and they then become a mortgage-backed security? Within the special term purpose agreement, there'll be <coughs> how many loans you need to go bad before this particular uh, credit derivatives asset uh, gets downgraded from a AAA to a triple B or whatever it might be. So what happens is if you have one loan go bad within the basket of assets, which are all mortgage loans, then you know the the AAA may not go down. But when you have five loans that go bad within that basket, or six or seven, um, that AAA mortgage backed security all of a sudden gets a downgrade, say to double A plus or double A minus or A minus. So the biggest problem with these mortgage backed securities that extended from the housing crisis, so to speak, is these mortgage backed securities were on sold to the bank's clients. Uh, whether they be, you know, fund managers that manage fixed interest portfolios, whether they be fund managers that manage money market portfolios, whether they be a high net worth individual that buys a mortgage security, whether it be a council that buys a mortgage backed security, or whether it just be, you know, any individual that can buy half a million of a mortgage backed security. So what you then see is if a mortgage backed security gets downgraded, and it gets downgraded quite substantially from a triple A to a double B minus or even not investment grade, the client, the professional client that's holding that mortgage backed security would start losing money on the price of that mortgage backed security. Say they bought the mortgage backed security at 102, and if the, the security starts to deteriorate because it has loans within the basket that are going bad, that price all of a sudden would go down to say 85 for example or 70. But what's more important is for councils for example, we have councils here, I don't know what America does, but here we have councils and councils were allowed under the, the New South Wales and the Victorian Government Act, they're allowed to invest in AAA mortgage-backed securities and they couldn't invest in anything lower. So as you can see, there's a problem here. If a council or an organization was only allowed to invest in the AAA rated security, and all of a sudden, suddenly something got a downgrade from AAA down to AA plus, or maybe let's say severe downgrade, say to triple B minus or triple B, that council or that corporate or that fund would be forced to sell that security. Okay, and would have to enter the market uh, through the broker or through the dealer to sell that security, which would then, you know, obviously make the price of that security even worse. Now, the same thing at the time that we saw all these mortgages being packed up in special purpose vehicles in 07. And don't forget at the time in 07, you had all these different, you know, house brokers going out there, you know, people lending money out to everyone. And the way they were remunerated, particularly in America and even in Australia, is they were remunerated by the amount of people they get to borrow money. So they'd get commission or brokerage for the amount of people that they get to borrow money. And the thing is, the problem was that they could, you know, the banks were lending out money to individuals on low documentation. In other words, they didn't go through all the documentation for the individual. It turned out some individuals weren't even, they didn't exist, you know, they were bogus. It turned out some individuals didn't even have any money coming in. Some individuals may have been on pensions and couldn't afford it. But the thing is, the way the ha the, the housing brokers that were selling the mortgages uh, were, enumerated, were remunerated, they were actually getting commission and bonuses. So this is what sort of started the 07, 08. So while they were getting commission and lots of money and they were making a fortune, and don't forget with a mortgage, it's a long-tailed asset. You know, someone will take a mortgage for 30 years. So whether it be a financial advisor or whatever it might be, they were all trying to get you and me into mortgages because they got paid a fortune in commission. And banks were very aggressive in terms of the business they were trying to get or even the building society or the credit society. So that's what caused this whole housing boom 
plaza. Oh, I've, got, I've got trouble saying words tonight. So essentially that's what happened. And then we started to see a deterioration in the, the housing market. And obviously uh, the banks have used the housing asset as collateral for the loan. But the problem was the housing market started to fall below the loan value. And thus the banks package those up, those loans, into a special purpose vehicle called a mortgage-backed security, and they on-sold them to, you know, councils and uh, charities, uh, foundations, you know, uh, religious organisations, that middle market. The middle market that's not totally a professional market, but they're not the mums and dads in the retail market. It's a middle market that does have money, but they're not necessarily the professional market. Now we also saw that in 08, 07 also in, court, in, in terms of collateralized debt obligations. The same sort of thing, but it was done in terms of corporate bonds. The corporate spreads on corporate bonds were actually deteriorating. In other words, the cost for a corporate to go and issue a bond was costing them more money and corporate spreads started blowing out. And the banks didn't want the corporate debt on their books, the corporate assets that they had bought. So what they then did with the corporate debt uh, paper or the corporate bond paper, they also packaged up all those corporates into a special purpose vehicle and basically called it a collateralized debt obligation. And they did the same thing. They went to Stan Poor's and Moody's and then they got a AAA rated uh, rating on that um, on that new asset called a CDO, collateralized debt, debt obligation, and they put up money uh, to give it, you know, a buffer in case there was bad corporate bonds that went bad within that basket of corporate bonds, and they got AAA from the rating agencies. Now, obviously, they then sold their AAA. Uh, assets, securities, to the middle market. And again, we saw the same thing. So, of course, the middle market here in Australia, you know, which is the council, small corporates, um, you know, small companies that have a lot of money, importers and exporters, um, you know, not-for-profit organisations, found foundations, religious organisations, you name it, started buying these uh, CDOs, these collateralized debt obligations, thinking that there was nothing in them except they were just a bond with a triple A. Now, they didn't understand them. The, the middle market didn't understand them because they didn't have the expertise. And again, the brokers that were working for the banks or the brokers that were in fixed interest or whatever were getting paid a lot of commission. So subsequently what then happened is people started losing money, the middle market investor, because one or two or three of these bonds or four or five started to go bankrupt, uh, which started to eat into the deposit that was put into these CDOs, uh, which was added as a buffer, uh, just in case some of these bonds did go bad. But unfortunately, more than five or six or seven bonds went bad. You know, it was more like 15 or 20 or 30. And subsequently, those CDO, CDOs got a rating below AAA. They went down from AAA down to triple B, down to triple B minus, which is the investment grade, and below investment grade. Now, any middle market, whether it be a council, whether it be, you know, a small fund, whether it be, you know, a corporate, uh, whether it be a not-for-profit, they generally have rules where they can only invest in investment-rated uh, bonds per se. So obviously when things got downgraded, they then had to sell and that would also put pressure on the price of that CDO, which they bought at 102 and then they had to sell it at 85. So again, they lost real money as well. Okay, so all the time, people are starting to lose money and people are exposed to credit risk and counterparty risk within these mortgage-backed securities and these uh, collateralized debt obligations. Now, coming back to the similar parallels we have now, 
from 2008 to 2009. To some degree, we're seeing that now. We're seeing, number one, a housing market that has gone a long way. Uh, you know, it's gone up a lot since 08. Certainly the housing market here in Australia has since 08 and pre-07. Uh, certainly the housing market in America has, and we've seen that. Uh, corporate credit spreads are at all-time lows, but they are now starting to move out, and that's what we started to see in 07. Spreads starting to move out on corporate credit spread, spreads and mortgage-backed securities. We're starting to see debt increase, and if I t take you to the total debt for the US, for example, you know, and looking looking at the 07 debt story, uh, non-mortgage and mortgage, this is the mortgage. We're starting to see that increase from five trillion up to about eight, and then it comes down slightly, down in 13, and then up again to 8.8. .8. We're seeing that again. We're seeing non-mortgage debt, which is personal debt, moving up again, which is around 15 trillion all up. If we go to interest rates, we're starting to see the same story. So let's just quickly um, go to interest rates as well. Let me just pull up some of these things, if my silly system is going to work. Um, interest rates are starting to rise. And basically, um, also, the Dow at the time in 07 was at an all-time high. And we see the Dow now at an all-time high as well. Let me just see if I can pull these things up. So if we have a good 10-year bond, the US 10-year bond, around this time, 07, 08, um, and it's a very similar sort of scenario. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. In 07, you know, we saw a 10-year bond around August, say, around 398. And, you know, money started becoming fairly tight. Then we saw in uh, the 1st of January, 08, you know, we've got this crisis happening and all of a sudden, the Fed starts injecting heaps of money into the system, okay? So we did see yields go higher pre that crisis, and then we start seeing the Fed injecting heaps of money into the system, which again brought the yield curve down, okay? So in July 08, we saw the yield curve at 186, then it got down to 0.22, then it went down to negative, okay? And we saw that right through until probably, you know, quite a quite a ways, okay, even up to 2013, it was still minus 11 on the 10-year. Now, if we go now to the current situation, we're now seeing interest rates rise, okay, and on a 10-year, we're starting to see it, you know, hit uh, through 2%, and if we go to a 30-year bond rate, we're starting to see it through 3%, okay. Now, when we start seeing 30-year bond rates through 3% or more, we start to note in the US economy, there starts to be mortgage stress, okay, um, which means people start having trouble generally paying back their their interest and they get into an interest arrears on their, on their mortgages, okay. So, and as I said, uh, basically, the total mortgage debt hasn't come down really since 07 or 09. So we can assume that the US still has the same level of mortgage debt, if not more, and we're looking at a raising rate environment. Uh, not only that, we do find, if we go to this debt monitor, that, um, you know, obviously US total debt, um, I'm assuming this is year on year, is up 168%, which is pretty massive. If we go to total personal debt, it's up 134%, uh, which, which is a lot, which basically means that uh, the debt per citizen is rising and their revenue is not, not actually rising. So, you know, it's saying revenue per citizen is 10305 but debt per citizen is 64000 odd. So it means that the US is in, in a debt position similar to what it was in 07, 09. Also, what we're also seeing is basically um, credit spreads, as I said, starting to... Um, starting to uh, go higher in yield and also what we're seeing is an equity market that is very very overextended so back in 2008 we saw the dow just looking at the dow around 15,000, which is around here uh where are we about here somewhere 2008 we saw the dow at around um 15, or more 
and there was a big move up and it was a big move from down here somewhere up to 15,000. Now since 0809 at this point here, we've seen nothing but the Dow go up. Okay, from literally 5,800 at its lows to now up to an all-time high of about 26,000 and currently at 25,400. Now, in my mind, that's a very, you know, and I'm not giving any one personal advice, but that is a very over-inflated equity market. And the equity market uh, relies on the premise that interest rates are low. Uh, don't forget, most of this time, interest rates were negative. <clears throat> and now we're seeing a positive yield curve rather than, uh, than a negative yield curve. And essentially, we're basically in a position where, you know, yields are going higher. And that's a very... That's not a great thing for equity markets at all. Um, so basically what it, what it tells us is uh, risk assets could come off quite a bit. And, you know, you had Morgan Stanley coming out there the other day and a few other big banks saying the same thing. And I tend to agree with them that risk assets could come off quite a bit. Um, and also the cost of funding, you know, could come off quite a bit. Also, if we look at the different yield curves internationally, uh, again, you know, if we look at, say, for example, uh, just say the US is here, the blue one, take it right down. This is a monthly, you know, rates were, you know, roughly about 1.4 going back to June 16. They're now at 2.9. This is for a 30 year, oh, sorry, it's for a 10 year bond yield. Wow, that's high. Okay, and they're, they're heading higher. Um, if we go down to, if we look at Italy, Italy's gone up quite a lot, 1.7 heading towards 2.9 you know if we look at um uh you know if we look at anything else australia you know australia will be in there somewhere but also generally what we're seeing is rates are rising everywhere and the risks are getting higher and certainly with um the trade war if you want to call it that with the us and china where um the president just raised <clears throat> another 200 billion dollars in tariffs china this is going to basically cause a massive decline in the receipts that China's owed. And again, those receipts uh, will obviously come off their, uh, their, their their treasury asset holdings and they'll look to sell those, which will also exacerbate uh, selling in the interest rate markets, which won't be great for, for risk assets at all. Now, again, tying this back to crypto, um, what does it mean for crypto land? And a lot of people ask me this question. Um, it's going to be an interesting one because either the market will see crypto as being a risk asset or maybe the market alternatively may see it as almost a safe haven asset. Um, the jury's probably out a bit on that because because it's such a new market, it's really going to be hard to say which way the market's going to take it um uh i suspect that you know there could be a you know a kickback in the sense um you know basically the market comes down initially and then maybe possibly uh you know the consumer and, and other participants will think that this is more of a safe haven in the crypto land again something i just want to point out to you too the us has low uh unemployment at the moment and the unemployment rate's just below 4%. If we go back to uh, 2008, we, we saw pretty much the similar sort of thing. Um, yes, around 2008, May, March 2000 and, uh, 2008, we saw, or say December, we saw it at 5%. So it did come off its lows. And this is the line here, if you look back in, in history, way back to 1955 where the U.S. really gets to a stage of almost like full employment and then everything else from here is, is pretty much up. So I think there there is a risk. I think there's a big risk. I think there, there's a risk that um, risk assets will come down in this environment. It's not personal advice. It's my own advice. This is not financial advice. It's my own. Um, and I think there is a big risk that they will and interest rates will go higher in that environment and... Um, Basically, uh, you know, initially probably in crypto markets, this is my personal belief, you could see, um, you know, the market, the asset class come down a little, but I think overall uh, it could be seen as potentially being a safe haven given that, you know, it can, it can settle cash instantly. 
and you know it's run on um, different fundamentals to the other fiat markets notwithstanding all these markets are interrelated because of cash okay even though the fiat markets have a delayed settlement on cash they're all related in cash uh, because if you get out of one market you've got to decide where you're going to put your cash next and that's why all the all the markets are related anyway look this is just food for thought i hope you get some uh you know some ideas from this um it's just something i've been thinking about i thought i'd put something else together just something to think about and food for thought guys thank you thanks for listening susie